So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the National Inventory of Primary Legal Materials. Uh, I did like the subtitles that uh, uh, the group dubbed the other, so I said this is the view from the law library instead of the view from the government otherwise. Um, so in brief, uh, let me get started. Uh, in a recent Golden Gate University Law Review, Chief, uh, California Chief Justice Ronald George wrote about historic reforms to the California court system and how these have enhanced access to justice and the like. However, there are problems, and Chief Justice George explained, courts in California currently operate more than 70 different case management systems with about 130 variations. The systems do not connect with one another and do not provide information across court and county jurisdictions. And he writes, we cannot afford to operate in an electronic tower, tower of Babel. And I thought that was really fitting. Even though Chief Justice George was only talking about California courts case management systems, a Tower of Babel frustration exists for anyone attempting to do legal research today. Uh, many of the legal research materials that we consider primary aren't freely available. What is free often carries a uh, warning that it can't be relied upon or is not official. For every state, there are different vendor relationships when it comes to publishing the codes and in the, the assertion of copyright on the material. Uh, the content behind law.gov might help reduce some of this confusion. So what is the national inventory? For law.gov to work, we really need to create a national inventory of all the primary legal materials, and then some. The inventory will be a packing list of sorts that describes details and catalogs where one can find the laws of our federal and state system. Um, and not just the materials we consider primary. That's why I have primary materials plus. Uh, we might want to note the availability of those items that are created as part of the process, from the briefs and filings of attorneys to congressional testimony and the like. Uh, for purposes of this inventory, I've actually used a definition of primary authority from the Legal Research Dictionary by Elise Fox, and I think she put it well. It is the law itself, authority that issues from one of the branches of federal, state, or local government as part of its function, or that issues from the Constitution. So back in January, we held the first Law.gov workshop back at Stanford. There's Carl. Uh, that's Roberta Morris. Uh, you do, what you don't see is Anurag Acherna from Google and uh, Jonathan Zittrain on the other side. And it was a really well-attended event, and we had lots of law librarians in the group. In fact, we were really lucky to have uh, from the Northern Association of uh, Law Librarians, uh, Northern California Association of Law Libraries, NoCal, we had both the current president, the incoming president, and past president, among other folks. So there were lots of librarians there. And this topic caused a lot of interest. And some of the biggest questions, I just want to share them with you because I think it's informative. Uh, what should we include in this inventory? That's the first question. What would we want to include? What type of materials like scope, content, format, price? Sh what form should it take? Should it be a wiki? Should it be something fancy? Um, how do we note potential copyright issues? Um, people are always afraid of kind of saying the wrong thing. How do we note that? What about IP issues regarding briefs and filings, which I think uh, Professor Boyle alluded to earlier? How do we organize the efforts to create the inventory? Is it going to be something done chapter by chapter at a national level? What about legislative efforts? Are we going to get involved with that front as well? And what about the vendors? Do we bring them into this process, as Carl had mentioned? And how does this build upon the work that Dean Danner talked about that the American Association of Law Libraries has written on the authentication process and so on and so forth. Are we going to be adding to this or really just building upon it? So at that very day, there was such excitement generated that an informal task force was developed on the spot. And we decided that our mission would be to create a prototype of the primary legal materials inventory, but for California alone. And our thought was that if the inventory idea was to really take hold, it would need to be developed and populated across the states with lots of volunteers. But we had to take the first stab at it and do a California model. And since California is a really big state, we thought this could be a really rich example. And then other groups could follow us. So after a few phone calls, low-tech phone calls, we, just, we created a Google mailing group. And anyone can join here. I can give you the information at the end. And we decided to go for simple, OK? We decided that you know, if we spent a lot of time developing this, the greatest platform ever for this, it would take too long. And Carl has a time frame on this, too. So we wanted to kind of support that model as well. No one wanted to become Drupal experts in our group. <laughs> no one wanted to learn something new. So we wanted to go with something simple. So we opted for a Google spreadsheet. And I'll try and open that up in a second. Um, likewise, we decided that we could have gone the way of just using Word 
and just sharing our notes occasionally. But we did want to do something that was shared. And the nice thing about Google Spreadsheets, and I'm not plugging in a particular, and it's not because they're former Google employees in the mix. Um, but we just thought, they are down the road from us. But, uh, uh, but we did think it was nice because Google is very easy for people to access. It's nothing scary. It's very easy to share, very easy uh, to main access, maintain access. Um, and also the tracking changes was really nice, and it's, it continues to be a very nice feature. Um, it's very easy for folks, and this is kind of a blank template if you want to look at it. Uh, it's very easy for folks to add content in it directly if they want to manually edit it, or we have a form, let me open up the next screen, that comes, you know, it's very easy to create, and so folks can go onto this form and add what they'd like. And I guess with all, I should say, with all things uh, created with forms and spreadsheets, uh, there is always that modification and improvement you want to make after you start it. Um, I guess hindsight and spreadsheets don't mix. And we have, uh, for example, like we actually should have clustered cities by their counties. We didn't. We will do this going forward. We will modify it. But it's unfortunate we didn't think that way at the, the initial point. Um, note to future groups. Uh, we also didn't include uh, a category for permanent public access. Uh, and we plan to add that going forward, but it's something we just, we're thinking it's not enough of an issue in California. And likewise, one of the members of our working group commented, we can skip an authentication category because this is the best quote of the, uh, the, the library mix. Nothing in the state of California is authentic. <laughs> nothing. Um, uh, so I thought it was classic. Uh, and there are also categories we created that even now, a few months later, we're realizing aren't that useful. And so, in, you know, if the next version comes along, we would just cancel certain categories. But there are some very important categories, and we are filling up some certain categories, especially dealing with copyright assertion, disclaimers, official status, and price information. Um, and I should note, sometimes it's really noting that there is a price, because it sometimes is hard to acquire that data. Um, and we suspect that these are going to still be important fields throughout the states, not just in California. Uh, and at this point, I wanted to share kind of a fun little story. I co-teach advanced legal research uh, at our school. And occasionally, we'll bring some of our real librarian concerns into the students, maybe to see if they're awake, but just to kind of gauge their, what they're thinking. And uh, one good example is Paul, who co-teaches the class with me, my, my director, uh, will bring in very skinny supplements to texts and bring them into the students and say, do you know how much this costs? trying to see if they have any sense of how expensive things are, trying to share his outrage at what publishers are doing to libraries. And usually we'll get a very polite, oh, that's horrible. And I'm like, blah, 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 back to Facebook or whatever. Um, and that's it. But we decided to give our students a law.gov homework project uh, just last week, actually. And we asked the students to each, because we have almost 50 students, to each take a state code and look at them in paper and online form and focus on just a few factors, on copyright language, disclaimers, and official status. And they actually, I'm not kidding, I think they really enjoyed it. Um, we also were easy on the grading too, probably. But uh, they were really engaged in the conversation and incredibly surprised by what they found. Um, they thought it was important and they thought it was something that they never really get to talk about in law school. So I'm glad we kind of opened their eyes to that. Um, and maybe for another day I can share, if there's time later I can tell you, what they thought were the most interesting states were Montana and Vermont. But that's another topic maybe with what we saw. But, but speaking of kind of notable trends, let me share a little bit of some of what we're seeing right now in California. So of the almost 540 municipalities and counties in California, from what we can tell, nearly 80% of them have outsourced their codes to just four commercial publishers. And... And that number might actually be higher as we go through this because some of the uh, cities make it a little hard to figure out who produced the site, uh, but that's what we're seeing so far. Uh, likewise, and these are kind of interesting, almost all these are online free. However, and the however is what always kills you, the almost 40% of them claim to be unofficial and have disclaimers. Almost 50% have copyright assertions, and there may be more. We think those numbers are going to go higher as we look deeper. Um, some of the tricky part, and this gets to also working in a large group with different volunteers, is defining what's unofficial. Some people feel uncomfortable saying something isn't official unless it says it is official. I know this is kind of slicing hairs, but uh, a lot of our volunteers would rather say not sure. So we will probably find that number goes up as we go back through what they did. Uh, and likewise, equally interesting, the paper versions of many of these codes, which are deemed to be official, um, are published by the same group that publishes the online version uh, and for a fee. Um, the price information on these things can be really tough because you usually have to call the publisher to get the price. It's not something that's readily available. So here's an example. I know it's tiny, so I'm going to just show you. This is the Laguna Beach Municipal Code. And um, 
It's produced by Quality Code Publishing. I don't know if you see their insignia there. They produce about 90 of the state's municipal codes, and most of them look, not the content, but the format looks almost identical. And they all have the same disclaimer, and I'll read it to you, as I looked at all 90 of them this weekend. Uh, the electronic version, and it's the tiny print at the top, the electronic version is provided for information only. Well, that's good. Uh, and should not be considered the official version of the code. Please consult the official printed version before citing provisions of this code. If inconsistencies exist between this electronic version and the official code and or the underlying ordinances, the official legislation will be considered definitive. Okay. Uh, so I said, well, gee, I want to find out what's definitive. So I called the city of Laguna Beach just to find out how much it would cost to purchase it and got a lovely person on the other end of the phone. And uh, she's like, oh, that's a good question. And I was like, do I have the right number? And she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's about $175, but I'm going to have to get back to you. And I said, oh, why? Uh, and I think this was the quote. I haven't sold one of those in who knows when. And... Uh, <laughs> And she's like, it's online. I was like, well, but do you sell them? She's like, yeah, but I'm going to have to get back to you and find out. And so, so that was not the only example, so more, more of the same. So here's closer to my home, San Jose, the California Code of Ordinances, produced by um, American Legal Publishing, and they do about 43 codes in the state of California. Um, some of them look a little different, but they all have the same disclaimer. And, uh, and notable, they all have a copyright assertion at the bottom. This is copyright 2010, American Legal Publishing. I don't know if you can see that, all rights reserved. Let me read you the disclaimer because I think that's also really good too. The code of ordinances and or any other documents that appear on this site may not reflect the most current legislation adopted by the municipality. So it's great. It's not even perhaps current. American Legal Publishing provides these documents for informational purposes only. There comes that only for information. Um, documents should not be relied upon as the definitive authority for local legislation. Additionally, the formatting of the posted documents may vary from the official copy, and the official printed copy of a code of ordinance should be consulted prior to action being taken. So don't waste your time with this, basically. Uh, if you did want to buy the official one for San Jose, it was very easy to get the price. It's about $300 plus $150 a year to keep it current. Uh, one of our volunteers actually called American Legal Publishing to ask about the copyright notice, wondering if it was something uh, at the behest of the city or if it was something by American Legal, and they said, have to get back to you, and we still haven't heard. Uh, but this also got a few of our volunteers talking about this one because this disclaimer that you see here and in most of the, the municipal codes that I'll, I've shown you, the, um, you don't see disclaimers like this in printed books. Uh, I mean, any librarian here knows that uh, you'll, mistakes happen in books all the time. You'll get those uh, replacement pages or those self-adhesive pages to stick in, all the librarians nod their heads, that you stick in the books. But you don't see disclaimers like this in the printed material. Um, but it keeps coming up on these websites again and again and again. And it just, it just makes you go, hmm. And the hits just keep coming because this one's really good. This is the Office of the Attorney General of California. And we were on this site looking for the opinions of the Attorney General. And this is, I think, one of the best ones. Due to the dynamic nature of the Internet, I love that, resources that are free and publicly available one day may require a fee or restrict access the next. That's good. That's good. And I love that they also cannot guarantee that it will be error free. Um, so I guess due to the dynamic nature of print publishing, if you want to buy this in official form, it's $400. Um, so that's tough. That's really tough. Um, and there's more. There we go. Uh, let's see. I'm only going to show you a few. We're not going through all like 700 things we've looked at so far. Um, this is what Carla mentioned, but I think it's worth looking at again. From the uh, Courts of California, this is uh, the disclaimer page, the first of the two disclaimer pages you get if you want to look at the searchable opinions archive from 1850 to the present of California appellate and Supreme Court decisions. It should be noted that uh, the state of California has a contract with Lexis, Matthew Bender, to produce the official reports. Um, and even though the, the archive is free online, you have to read through this agreement. And then when you click on the continue button, you click through to another license agreement you have to select that, uh, that you have to agree to that's over 2,500 words long, quite detailed. But let's share some of this because I think this is good too. There is no charge for using this. And they're saying there is only copyright, no copyright in the text of the decisions, but only in, let's see, the uh, let's see, uh, head notes and summaries are subject to copyrights. So they're not in the archive. But the best is probably the last line. The official reports page is primarily intended to provide effective public access to all of California's presidential appellate decisions. It is not, this is, this is classic, it is not intended to function as an alternative to commercial, computer-based services and products for comprehensive legal research. Um, 
You mean Lexus? <laughs> she produces this. Uh, and I swear to you, if you go through the license agreement on the next screen, and I don't feel like doing it, because I think if you click through, you give up the right to your firstborn. I mean, it is very specific what it talks about. Like, you can't reproduce it. You can't uh, re-engineer it. You can't do anything with it. I think you're just supposed to look at it in awe. Um, and one of our uh, ALR students, when we were talking about this last week, uh, made a comment, would this be malpractice for me to use that? And I think that's a really interesting question. Um, one we will not answer today, but a really interesting one. Uh, and I think this is the last of our humdingers. Um, this is actually on the court site as well. The California courts produce uh, civil jury instructions. This is called khaki in California. And this I'm sharing with you as an example of a confusing copyright uh, uh, illustration. The khaki on the California website, it actually claims to be official online, and it is identical to the paper version. Uh, Lexus is the official publisher, Matthew Bender Lexus. But look at this copyright assertion. Our, we, we were joking that's like the Christmas turkey because every little part of it has been carved up. I mean, you, you know, the assertion is blah, 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 but not to this, this, and this. However, Matthew Bender has everything but that, that, and that. So it's incredibly detailed. And what's notable, too, in the paper, paper official version, it looks the same. And for the unofficial version done by West, it's basically cut and paste this and just strike out Matthew Bender and put Westlaw in. And it's the same copyright. And this is a very difficult example for our inventory because we just had like a checkbox that said yes. And this really <laughs> doesn't really fit neatly into yes or no because it was pretty complicated. And I, there's probably going to be more like this that we see as we go along. Um, we noted that there is no assertion by Matthew Bender to life expectancy tables. And we figured that's good because ours will be shorter after reading this. Um, and the, so that is a challenge, which brings me to the challenges we have with the inventory. So the first and foremost is probably finding volunteers and keeping them interested. Uh, we're actually pretty lucky. We have about 20 volunteers in our working group. And uh, we send out annoying notices on email, getting people to, to sign up. Um, we also, I hit up a lot of the folks who came to the first workshop saying, you are interested enough to come. Will you please help? And, uh, and I should also acknowledge that some of the volunteers actually work at Stanford Law Library. No peer pressure there, but we're happy to have them. Um, and it is hard to keep people motivated because it is a bit of work. Uh, and getting fresh blood is good, but I think some things that help are actually um, free stuff and swag. And I'm so glad Carl has like these little badges and magnets. So this is really good. We're hoping we get more of that. That'll be really fun. It helps. Little free stuff goes a long way. Um, just for what it's worth, we also joked about having virtual happy hours while we're doing this. Um, but there's a call to have a real one. And given that we're all pretty slap happy about some of this stuff, we're thinking we'll do it in Lemon Grove, California. Anyone from Lemon Grove? If you look at their municipal code site, they claim to have the greatest climate on earth. So that would be a nice place for a drink. Um, but that gets me to municipal data. Filling in all the blanks is really tricky. There's a lot of content that we need to look at. And it's stuff that, even though many of us have been law librarians for a long time, it's things we haven't seen. These are not things that we use every day. So it does take a bit of town uh, time to get through all these towns and counties. Um, consistency is also tricky because uh, there are many different ways of defining some of these things. And uh, I was mentioning version control and uh, tracking changes is really helpful on Google Spreadsheets because every once in a while, I'll see a certain volunteer will make changes. And there's always the, the shy volunteer and the very bold volunteer, and I'll know who they are. So we're like, oh, so-and-so edited, better go back and check. Um, because I, I know that certain people are just a little cautious, and I just need to keep, keep an eye on that. Um, the pricing data is really tricky because, as you know, Dean Danner knows this and other folks here know this, you know, vendors have different relationships with so many different entities, so you might have a different pricing plan, different discounts. And uh, we, we've learned that it's quite challenging to get exact prices. If there is such a thing, I don't even know if there is. Uh, maybe we need Ken Svangalas, who does a pricing guide for legal information to help us kind of fight this down. But uh, we're really just pretty happy to get information that there is a price. And, uh, and I'll just share this as a funny kind of hiccup. So one of our volunteers, one of our best volunteers, uh, works for a court. And she, when she signed up, she's like, you know, I recently ordered materials that you're looking at for the court, and I know how much they were. I did the invoices. They're all on my computer. I said, great. Can you tell us how much they are? She's like, well, according to rule of court, blah, 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 you need to file an official request. I was like, okay, so I'll file an official request for these prices, which was really funny because it went right to her desktop. And then she opens the request and shoots me a personal email saying, I, I see your request. As soon as I approve it, I'll put them all into the inventory. And so <laughs> this took like five extra steps, but it's all up there now, so it's good. But I think these are one of the things, if you are going to work on this project, you should just know about. Um, Looking forward, maintaining the content is going to be tough because even though Carl is probably going to be done hopefully this summer, I think this inventory, if we start it, we should keep it fresh and, and, and uh, 
constantly uh, updated because otherwise it's really just going to be a, a relic. Um, and getting other chapters to do similar work. Um, I, I think today, AAAL government relations folks are actually going to send out a notice with documentation to seven states about getting their um, inventory started, which is awesome. I'm so excited. That's great. And, uh, and I think uh, it's fitting because uh, when Jonathan Detrain spoke at our event, he said that we were at the not the birth of the idea, because Carl had that some some time long ago on a deck somewhere or something with a drink. But this is the birth, the cradle of an idea. And so if we really do want this to thrive, we need to take good care of it and see that it evolves. Speaking of, how many North Carolina librarians do I have in this room right now? Raise your hands. Actually, better, can you guys stand up and take a bow? Because we love <laughs> librarians. OK, so you know who you are. Do you have scratch paper or a laptop? Yes. Yes, nods. OK, so I'm going to give you exactly one minute right now. And I want you to write down the title of a primary source in North Carolina. I see, oh, I see Dean Danner's doing it. And I want you to write, see if he's doing it, you should do it too. The, uh, all the cool kids are, jot down the publisher name if you know it. Is it online? Is it official? Is it free? Anything you know. Just spend a moment. You've, I've eaten up like 20 of the seconds, so just, no pressure. No wrong answers either, so just go for it. I'm not really watching the clock, so just click. It's like Jeopardy. You can collaborate. <laughs> this is the beginning, the end. OK, I think I'm going to call time. Did you all write something down? Some of you did? Yes? Donna did. Congratulations, the North Carolina inventory has been born. You started it just now. That's the best part. No, it is that easy. That's all I want you to know. It is easy. Don't get intimidated. You just have to get started. And if any of you want blank templates or forms, see me. I am happy to supply them. And I just want to close with saying that I think as librarians, we have a natural claim to this. So we should own it, document it, and keep it alive. So that's all. And my information if you want to contact me later. Thanks. Questions for Erica on either her um, trip to Yosemite or her taxi? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have one, Erica. Um, uh -oh. Often when it looks at uh, pricing information, the pricing is for a single copy for mm -hmm. yourself. Exactly. And I'm wondering, are you um, asking about licensing if somebody wished to make a copy of a municipal code and, say, put it online for everybody to use? That's a good question. We're trying to get that. But the tricky thing is if we're not able to even get the cities to tell us how much their paper code is, mm -hmm. getting a license answer is going to be even trickier. So I think this is going to take a lot more nudging. So here's uh, a suggestion. Mm -hmm. yes. um, maybe you could get a shill like the company Justia to send in <laughs> letters to some of these code uh -huh. publishers and inquire about commercial licensing mm -hmm. and what the prices might be. And Excellent. this would be very useful on a national basis. Um, one of the things that we're hoping to demonstrate with the national inventory is that if Stanford, for example, wanted to put a common set of all the municipal codes of California online, reformat them in valid HTML, mm -hmm. re-index them, how much would that cost in order to get the licenses to do that? And you can't do it for all 540, no. but if we had a dozen price points, it might be a useful yeah. thing. No, and that's good, but the tricky thing, as I was saying, is like we're still having such a hard time getting the cities to tell us how much their codes are, which just should tell you something, that they're not even able to tell you how much their official printed version is. Yeah. So. And I think that lesson is important for North Carolina and the other states in that you're not going to get a definitive listing of everything. Uh, but painting the picture of what the situation is like, where might there be issues, are they in the judiciary, the executive at the state or at the county level, um, is going to be very helpful, I think, for yourself as librarians, uh, but also on a national basis for painting a picture of access to the law. Um, so my, I, this is more a question, oh. more a comment than a question, Derek. But it seems like it would be really wonderful to write up as a short piece for. I'm trying to think. The green bag. I don't know. Some <laughs> some periodical that might be read by people in the judicial conference. Mm. That might be your horror stories. Yeah. Because horror stories are actually. I mean, studying the history of the environmental movement. <laughs> There was high theory, mm -hmm. but there were also quilting of horror mm -hmm. stories, right? And it's it's the you know here is the, 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 the here is the canal that is on fire, right? <laughs> here is here is the place where you can't see each other across the canyon, mm -hmm. right? And 
these are just too funny to be kept to your PowerPoint, besides which the next time you, you probably are going to show your tax return. So, you know, it's yeah. higher risk for you. So, um, Speaking of horror stories. <laughs> right. yeah. So um, I just think it would be, I think that would be really powerful mm -hmm. because when you know, David Levy today was offering, you know, really thoughtful and I thought, you know, good corrective on the problems that had to be gone through. But then, you know, his reaction to the idea that states are claiming copyright over their codes, even just that idea, is, well, that's just offensive. Mm -hmm. And that's just over the idea that they're claiming it, let alone that they're making these kinds of assertions. And so I think mm -hmm. this is really the, the, the wedge that mm -hmm. makes people realize the importance. And I think Carl grasped that a long time ago. Oh, thanks. Thank good you idea. so much for doing thanks. it.